Так, уважаемые коллеги, есть Distinguished colleagues, I suggest we should start. I apologize for the delay. We're expecting Mr. Zubov to join us, but he is coming late. But the point is that I have a flight to catch, so I was asked to make a short introduction without much ado. Inaugurating the event, I'd like to say that the Global Cities Innovation Index is a very important tool by the ISEC. It is a toolkit to make managerial and governance decisions. It is a benchmark in innovation, I, I would say. In the HSC, we have been trying to guide our academic and scientific activities so that it be evidence-based and should help make informed decisions. Otherwise, losses of billions or trillions of dollars may be incurred, so even a slight mistake in measurements or calculations may result in huge losses, in particular in the sphere of innovation. That is the subject of our today's event. It is it is a benchmark that is meant for the decision makers and the innovators to try to make up their mind whether to invest in this or that CC to create added value or put up money in an innovative ecosystem. And now we have added the creative industry and the creative class on top of that innovation sector and the creative people are also creative in their decision making so the evidence based of any kind of decision making is our overarching priority for the hsc and academia by and large i have tested the conditions offered to innovate in Moscow. I have used my navigation to come to this premises and I actually haven't been able to enter the door from the first attempt, but the, 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 the advantage it is a glass door, you know, I was lucky. So it's not all smooth. So Moscow does not rank number one in this rating, which means that there is room for advancement. There is always this room. And uh, it's obvious in a number of parameters of the GCII for this city, for the capital of Russia, and this is good. And I also am aware that other cities in this country also look to that rating because they are in search of the parameters to improve, to make part of the rating, to become innovatively attractive. Being in being the rector of this university, I now understand that when the ranking of cities attractive for students was unveiled, those cities moved really up in their performance and foreign students started arriving there and in internationally recognized agencies published that ranking which is a good example to cite so i think that the hsc being renowned globally and the team led by mr gohberg and mr kuchenko has a very good international standing has one international acclaim, so the ranking is conspicuous worldwide. And I believe that the parameters used that are subject to discussion today shall be modernized given the international situation. Call the international colleagues to see how we have been developing innovation here in this capital 
and in other cities of the Russian Federation, so that no one should have doubts that Moscow has the lead in innovation in this country. So, Mr. Goldberg, thank you very much. Uh, I will yield to you so that you can moderate, and I apologize for having to go. I have a flight to catch at 5.35 from Domodedovo. Now it is 3.20, so I cannot stay any longer. I promised to leave and depart at 2.30, but still I'm here with you. Anyway, excuse me, please, I apologize. I'm so glad to see you, and I wish our capital to go up in this ranking next year, but we shouldn't be the first city would have the top position as that will relax us too much as we should be catching up with the leader thank you thank you very much thank you very much mr nisma for a good flight and safe flight I, I i hope i can catch the flight if you can't catch it please come back and stay with us please sit down around the table dear colleagues it's not a solemn grand ceremony it is an expert discussion so please gather around the table never hesitate please So let us begin the discussion. Indeed, our research team for, for a while, for a number of years, has been focusing on the cities, clusters and regions and their role in innovation development. And uh, the ranking that we are to discuss today is the pinnacle of the huge pyramid, comprised of a number of different studies. So it is the second edition of the ranking. Although the, the model and the pattern is brand new, we'll stop at that. So the cities are centers of science and technology, in institutes, universities, venture firms, knowledge dissemination centers. Centers for commingling innovative industries and production sites. So we try to reflect the all round range of aspects that account for the innovation attractiveness. We know very well the initiatives that are adjacent to the project, like the Global Innovation Index, and we are part of that consortium. And I'm a member of the International Advisory Board there. So they also try to make assessments of cities by formal parameters like the number of publications and patents. There is an Australian ranking rather narrowly formalized. So we tried to go beyond the framework of formal parameters to present a comprehensive landscape of uh, the aspects of innovation attractiveness and Eugene will tell you more about that but the, the three main pillars are ranking the techno technological development creative economy and the urban environment based on the metrics so it is a composite index we have been trying to provide a systemic overview of these aspects it's composite because for each city we have a hierarchy of indicators that allows us to assess specific positions for a city by different innovate innovation attractiveness parameters another point to mention especially is that we have the focus on talents these are the individuals that decide what makes cities attractive, like young researchers and scientists want to reach out to grant professors and the creative people want to arrive at the short workshops of masters and venture capitalists watch closely 
successful entrepreneurs. So it all revolves around individuals, people. Yesterday, together with Sperbank and other major companies and federal agencies, we had a discussion on the prospects of the AI development and regulation. A lot is spoken about that nowadays, and I cited a quote from a recent interview by Warren Buffett to one of the American TV chains. That person is not in any way linked to the AI for the bulk of us. And he said three quick lines. He said, recently, Bill Gates came to see me and told me about chat GPT. And I told Bill Gates, let's try and rewrite my way, recompose my way song in Spanish. And Bill Gates did, did that with the help of chat GPT in several seconds, but the only uh, drawback of the AI is that it is not capable of joking. So Warren Buffett concluded that it is, it is a huge giant leap forward. So that means that Buffett has started considering and contemplating investing in that sector and a great deal of people started investing in the AI. They rushed to invest. So it is all about the leaders and opinion leaders and newsmakers. Another noteworthy thing before we begin the discussion. We tried to step aside from the traditionalist view on innovation and different metrics. And we tried to combine the standard parameters with the new metrics that allow us to expand our understanding when we try to describe the phenomenon of innovative attractiveness. For that sake, we mobilized dozens of specialist databases to have data that allow to have new assessments and a new perspective on cities. And definitely it's a, a broad range of data starting from venture investors and startups and up to movie and film, film festival databases and uh, international awards and foremost the foremost. Some of the rules we had to abide by, first of all, these should be open and transparent databases and internationally measurable and comparable databases. We declined categorically to use municipal level info because it cannot be compared and contrasted. It only reflects local practices and does not allow, allow us to have a broader picture. Then we applied the data in the, in the report and we applied special statistics procedures for credibility and robustness assessment. It is a very important thing and uh, we had to exclude some of the parameters. Well, like those of you who have been following us know that we have been publishing the ranking of innovative development of the Russian regions and the new edition is coming shortly. It's going to come out soon and we'll invite you. And, and we have had statistical tests and some of the parameters we dropped out because it turned out they are not valuable enough. They can be only pinpoint indicators, but they will not work properly within a system. And uh, a couple of more quick points. We have critically expanded the sampling um, versus the previous edition. Last time we had 36 cities, now we have two hundreds. It is in the database that we have been establishing since then. Embraces more than 2,000, 2,700 cities. But that is too much for, for a sampling. So we have pre-selected the top 200 and analyzed these cities. Well, apart from the ranking as a number of metrics, we have been able to come up with individual profiles of 100 cities to assess their strong and weak points. And more, more, moreover, 
on top of that, we have added best practices review. The director has spoken about the methodological value of ratings, and we know that a number of figures or just ranking them per se would be merely a hype. But the main thing for us is to learn lessons and to know which practices work and, and which of them are more or less sufficient. The main thing is to be able to fine tune the, the toolkit that we have, I mean, the federal and the, the city authorities to be able to improve the cities that we live in. We have very simple configuration and the composition of the participants. It's a very narrow circle and it's deliberately done. So we want to have a narrow circle for the meaningful discussions. And those sitting around me at the table, there are two wings. And uh, one of them represents this city. And we want to know how the city perceives all that we have written. And on the other hand, there are the federal authorities with their own bodies and development institutions so we are interested in in their perspective so anyway once again it is not a solemn discussion it is an expert panel so another important thing to mention we have two international experts that they have joined us online professor joe rabbits from the manchester university one of the most renowned researchers of the innovative policies and, and economics in cities and joe has now been doing visionary studies in the future of cities. And we also have Austrian Cerritos, head of the S&T Research Lab of the HSC. He used to work at the Manchester University now for 10 years, has been with the HSC team. I hope they can hear us loud and clear. So, Evgeny, over to you to begin the report. First of all, I'd like to talk about creativity, technology being embraced by more and more countries, the evolution of technology. And there are people who know more about this report than me, Kirill Churchev, technology. Victoria Boas, all creative industries. Alexander Snigiriov for urban environment. So colleagues, as part of networking, you can ask more questions to know more details about specific topics. Now, in terms of the methodology, it's uh, all laid out in detail. What indices? or uh, have been processed, what kind of correlation we have. So you can have a look. Well, I, actually it's more than, it's more important or it's more valuable to read it once than to listen to reports about this index for a hundred times. So you might seem that uh, cities are more compact and it's easy to measure measure them than countries but it's the opposite you have fewer data like uh, gii they do the national index and they have a chapter on cities and there are just two indices patents and publications what about as for wipo the world intellectual property organization feed some of the data, but that's uh, not sufficient to measure innovations. That's just the start of the innovations. So it was the, the starting point for us, and we did our own cal cal calculations, but we decided to go deeper, and this is why we combed more data, and then we also raised uh, a bigger issue. What is the definition of a city? And sometimes you might see different criteria. And, you know, we've been trying to figure out what the common standard is, what the common definition is. So there are a host of issues 
and we split it into uh, high-tech development, creative industries, and uh, urban environment. Well, that's part of the handbook on innovations. We believe that technology and creativity are the two sides of one coin. It's all about uh, creativity and uh, like coming up with a new product. So you may accumulate new patterns, new data, and you will also approach it uh, from uh, personal creativity. But in a city, the any city is the venue where these uh, two areas overlap, where they meet. I might see designers, venture capitalists in the same place. So we need to measure both sides in an equal way, with an equal weight. And you have to add an, the urban environment to it. So it's quite pretty common. But there's one caveat in terms of innovations. We see that there's a certain cycle in here, and prof professionals are aware about this cycle. But the creative industries don't have any common cycles. They live their own lives, and they have their own, their own complexities, and we measure them in a specific way, and that was a challenge for us. Now, the previous speaker talked a lot about methodology, and I'd like to speak about it as well for a few minutes. Now, we had actually to uh, basically invent data because you only have patents, publications, and no stats at all. Sociology doesn't help us because people dif live in different uh, cities. How am I going to poll them for different things? There used to be a, an interesting case study in Germany about railroads. They don't quite they don't often use or they use them and uh, they rank them as satisfactory just three out of five but in the us most of the people don't use railroads and that's why they ranked it excellent five out of five so sociology doesn't work we also have our own i4 um, like ai machine and well, if you use administrative data, no one's going to believe it. And so we thought we figure it out a new way. I would say it's the we relied on the biggest private aggregators of data, and they are international, they are widely acclaimed, and so they are well known, widely recognized. And it's so it's the opinion of people who. So we cannot use just some private opinions on music, for example. We need aggregators. We used Crunchbase for startups and unicorns. For universities, there are three international rankings that we use where you have the HSE, you have the higher education, it's one of them. Our highly cited scientists, we use the web of science regardless of the cities. So Web of Science is only interested in such highly cited individuals, 6,000 individuals, Nobel Prize winners. Farfetch was used uh, for brands. As for the landmarks for science, the museums and galleries, how do we measure them so that we don't offend anyone that would be trustworthy? Let's take TripAdvisor, okay? Very simple. Okay, you can take the data, but they've been never used to measure cities, the performance of the cities. That's the benefits. They're not influenced. They're not influenced by city officials, but on the flip side, you need some arduous task to process them. So you have 6,000 highly cited scientists, and you need to double check everyone, and they can be affiliated with. Uh, several dozens of uh, cities or universities and you need to figure out where it is so just imagine how much work we had to put into it and that's the power of university that's where we had to attract more than 100 interns so we had the first ranking in 2020 and that's the beauty of the university we always uh, provide acknowledgments to these people. Without them, nothing would have happened. 
So you can only come up with such a ranking based on the enormous manpower provided by the university. So why do we only have two Russian cities? That's what the journalists asked us. Well, definitely everyone wants to have more Russian cities, but we didn't pick anything, you know, that's just the universe. So there were 21,900 leaders. Leaders, so I mean, the creative leaders, technology leaders, and they live in several hundred cities. You know, we went to Moldova, we've got a fashion star, we found that person. We gathered the data from Moldova. We went to, you know, we asked our colleagues in Kazakhstan. So that we decided to get a top 200 cities so that we don't have another volume of Karl Marx's capital book. So here is the top 50. I don't want to comment on it so that you can, uh, so that I don't steal the pleasure of reading from you. And we're also focused on the specific area. So if you take 74 parameters, so if you do an average, well, it's really hard to interpret it by, with the human brain. So you need to have, get the full picture of your place and this system coordinates to be able to see all the pros and cons. And the previous speaker talks about foreign students. And that's the definitely the pro for Moscow and St. Petersburg. In terms of foreign students, Moscow is sixth out of all cities of the world, all cities of the world, not just from summer sample, but it's across all the cities. That's quite a high figure. So I'd like to focus on some of the um, key takeaways that I thought are the most exciting. Well, first about technology, creativity, and then some general conclusions. Now, in terms of technology, we see that the world is moving towards a technology parity. The colleagues from GII that look at countries and um, technology agglomerations, they came up with the conclusion that China and uh, the US are equal in terms of uh, cities in the top 100. So East and West have reached some kind of parity, Japan, South Korea, are also catching up. Now, if you take top 20, you've got five Chinese, five US cities. So top 50, nine from each and top 100, 15 from China and 21 from the US. So it means that mega cities are in China are great but the US still boasts a belt of second tier cities. That's quite an interesting phenomenon. And we might need to think about it here in Russia as well. Surprisingly, Asian cities are great in terms of corporations, 200 headquarters from 2,500 uh, biggest companies uh, with uh, the biggest uh, capex on uh, R&D, but Western cities are still more exciting. Well, we know that Tokyo is full of corporations, but it's second or third in Asia in terms of startups, and it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's only second or third after Singapore. So, and they've uh, discovered that and they've been trying to catch up. Now, what is the, what are the most popular areas? It's universities. What else did we identify? As we juxtaposed Europe and Asia, Mass science versus egalitarian. So Beijing, 700,000. Uh, that's on 
more than twice as in the US, 300,000. So in terms of the figures, Chinese cities are far ahead, like in patents. But if you look at the leaders, at the highly cited uh, scientists who were Nobel laureates, you know, the Nobel laureates in Beijing, here is the number of publications. There are just two Nobel laureates uh, in Beijing and 40 in Boston. And it's Paris who is the leader, 16 Nobel laureates who live there right now. So that's quite an exciting phenomenon, quality and versus quantity. Everyone wants six quantity, but the Chinese have reoriented and we have uh, Ms. Ivanova, who's uh, released a bulletin that says that China has reoriented uh, from quantity of patents to quality. And there are quite an, a lot of uh, interesting tidbits. Now, we saw some corporate signs that seems to be under the radar in certain cities. UNESCO published a science report at once in five years, and they see in stronger in interest by cor the corporate world in uh, fundamental science, not just uh, application, not just publications. Everyone's into space right now, and we we can confirm this. That's what we've seen. We saw a lot of publications uh, also indexed by Scopus and high quartile magazines, high quartile journals, Siemens, Huawei. They have, they boast so many publications. So that's the people who move science forward. The authorities uh, in every country stimulate innovation, but it boils down to the fact whether the business community also six this uh, or not. Now, the first uh, deliverables in terms of the creative industry, you know, we're not shocked. We knew that uh, we, would, we saw the same results uh, two years ago. We believe that there is a lot of inequity. Creative leaders or stars are very particular about their residence. Five cities account for more than half of the brands, fashion brands, and in terms of architecture, architecture bureaus. So there's a lot of inequality in this field. Why is it so important? Why does it matter? We measured the leaders. Well, you can ask, why do we need the leaders? But it's all about decision-making. The creative industry could be viewed as a social function or as an element of urban environment, correct, right? Like nice benches, the facades, that's creativity. You need to have this, you need to engage creative people. But the trick is that it's the economy of stars, as they call it. Just one example, 1% 1 of musicians earn 77% of the revenue in this market, 1% earn 77%. That's the creative industry. So do you want to have a lot of creative people who unlock their potential of the city? Great. But who's going to pay for it? Or do you want creative industries to be as industries to, that will generate revenue, jobs, etc.? If you want the second one, then you'll face tough competition. That's how we view it. And we've also identified some of the creative industries that uh, look towards uh, cities, that uh, PR, fashion, cinemas, uh, architecture. We also looked at the patterns, correlations between the different uh, parameters. We see that the world of technology and the world of creativity you know, somehow overlap. Venture capital could be called an exception, you know. Venture capital 
and creative cities uh, overlap. Yes, that's the only area where they overlap. And here's one example. When we study unicorns, we do see creative stars there. Take Shane, it's top 10 of the most expensive unicorns. It didn't exist 10 years ago. That's the producer of ultra cheap uh, clothing from China. They produce it under their own production. It's like Shane, yes? They just put their own label, but here's what they do. They just track all the latest European trends and reproduce them very quickly. So the value of this company is higher than the capitalization of Gazprom. There was no Shane 10 years ago. Yeah, well, we can stop with this example. Now, just a few major takeaways. We have uh, quite a major chapter on urban environment, uh, and I'd like to direct you to reading the book, but just a few highlights. Every city introduces innovations. We all, we, everyone boasts Wi-Fi networks, but it's a small number of cities who attract these innovators. Here is the distribution of uh, unicorns, or if you take fashion brands in the creative industry, that's the distribution. So either you buy it and introduce, or you somehow attract uh, these innovators the good or maybe the bad news is that they're very mobile. There's high mobility among these unicorns uh, and these innovators. More than 30% of the venture startups are migrants. So they started in one country and they moved to another country. 30%, how much? Is it big or not? Well, that's the same figure for Nobel laureates. They are highly mobile. They want to leave where they want and the same for successful entrepreneurs and you know they're not encumbered with uh, natural resources uh, or plants take the volgograd region they invented clerics and then they moved to dublin and the volgograd uh, authorities yeah that city on the volga a river they learned about this company sometime later sometimes after the, the company moved to dublin so they're highly mobile israel india china the us and the uk that's where the countries that uh, are abandoned and there is a, there are a lot of u.s scientists who want to go to Bay to china we looked at their profiles their backgrounds they have uh, they are of chinese origins but they were born in china so that ch that's the children of those who initially migrated from china their children, who are highly qualified, went back to China and set up their successful companies. And uh, China boasts the second place in the world in terms of these companies. If you take Foresight, uh, we know that the Foresight Journal runs a piece on this. So every country in the world have introduced special benefits to, to attract these innovators, these stars. Back in the 1990s, you know, started with celebrities, athletes, uh, and today it's venture capitalists, venturing investors, uh, digital nomads, those who earn a lot. And the number of uh, stimuli that you use to attract them is growing. It's not just visas, it's soft landing. When you provide them with uh, housing offices, you have the green light to their business. So you provide uh, English language, uh, kindergartens uh, and uh, schools to them. And sometimes you just give uh, hang handouts, you know, 
And Shenzhen, that's a city in China, they can provide a grant of up to half a million US dollars. So an extra 30 to 40 million rubles to your visa, soft landing, etc. So it means that the other locations will have not to compete, will have to compete not with the Silicon Valley, but with Shenzhen, who is ready to, you know, splurge out a huge uh, amount of banknotes to attract these people. The countries are introducing, uh, rolling out more and more regimes like this to appeal to these talents. The UK embarked on a new innovation strategy when it was afraid that uh, these digital nomads will move out from the expensive London to the cheaper towns and will downshift. So they now say that if you graduated from top 50 universities, not British ones, but then you need a special visa and you don't need to prove anything, welcome to England. If you're part of the unicorns, if you're part of the fast growing companies, then the your staff will get uh, special visas uh, regardless of where they are and you can freely move and um, easily move your people from London to elsewhere, from elsewhere to London. So there's going to be a huge competition between countries and cities and I'm almost uh, close. Well, it's not always that size matters. We saw a few small cities. We saw that there are some minor inefficient cities. Universities are at the backbone, like Itaka, it's Cornell University that's in the Ivy League. Uh, it's a population of 30,000, but still Durham. Let me double check. That's a univers Duke University. It's part of the Research Triangle in uh, North Carolina. So they have the Lurban Catholic University. It's a top one in terms of innovation in Europe. Heidelberg, they have the oldest university in Germany. Rochester, Boston, well, you, they don't need to talk a lot about it. Rochester has uh, the medical facility of Mayo, that's the key medical research facility in the US. But it's not just like a science town as we see here in Russia. We look to the top 50 small cities here and 37 of them ha host uh, the headquarters of uh, at least one of uh, major companies. And there's at least one unicorn. Well, that's an extra third or fourth function of universities. So it's not just uh, science, it's unicorns, major companies and universities attract such major firms even to cities with a small population. We have a lot of uh, indicators and we've we identified niche leadership. Shenzhen is great in industrial design. Lima leads the world in terms of ads uh, and PR agencies. India, that's a story in itself. The third place in unicorns, new star in high tech. And they've got cities with startups, uh, unicorns, and etc. And uh, they are top of uh, the sub indexes. So we need to identify uh, our pros and then bet on them, rely on them to compete and thrive. Now I can talk about it on end. It's been an exciting study. We did it for a year, really loved that time. And we also came up with 13 case studies, successful case studies. and. It's not about Silicon Valley's, you know, these are some areas which would be surprising to you, something really original, something out of the ordinary, something that was uh, out of the box, 
and we hope that that the mayors, the researchers would uh, love it, and anyone who's interested in urban development. Thank you. That's it. Back to you. Well, thank you. It's quite an exciting, quite exciting research, and it's memorizing uh, narrative. And I think we need to do a video about this, colleagues. Since you know we are a little little bit out of time, I would like to first allow our speakers to say a few words, and then we'll invite everyone for a debate. So, we believe that a rating in itself is not, is not uh, that important. Uh, it's not an academic exercise. It needs to be important for decision makers. It needs to inform decision makers to provide a feedback loop so that the authorities would need to reevaluate uh, what's good or bad. Uh, and so that they can recalibrate uh, the stimuli that they have, the inventives that they have. So at first, I'd like to give the floor to our colleagues from Moscow, from the Moscow government, who are also who were ranked as part of this research. What about Moscow? What's your take? Will you use it in your real decision making? framework. So now I'd like to give the floor to our colleagues from Moscow. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak here today. I'd like to thank the entire team who's worked on this ranking. I know how hard you fought for each of the cities, for each of the indexes, and, uh, you know, we are a lot with you. You did, our digital team fought with you and the great, I really love the value of your, uh, of your product. Thank you, Yevgeny. So at the very beginning, you said that the product of a university is a tool for decision-making and as a person who has been lucky to be part of the team can fully subscribe to it and as part of a ranking, we been working hard to recalibrate our existing incentives and design new ones. Uh, and uh, back to your questions uh, on how we're going to use it. Here's what I can say. From the perspective of perception, for us, the rating is a dual tool. On the in the first instance, it is a very good source of best practices. We analyze. The PSAT's practices a lot, and we have been watching and studying them, trying not to see who is on which position, but what the outcomes are for specific cities, because national benchmarking is a separate line of activities from the standpoint of understanding the policies of other capitals worldwide. And, and uh, number two is understanding the system of coordinates and where we stand there. Yevgeny has said that innovation is multifaceted, that it's very hard to measure one's performance in this or that aspect, because all the innovation infrastructures, intellectual property and companies' efforts, a number of other spheres are included. For us, the, rate, the ranking is a system of coordinates, is it? and a reference to assess the, the performance and excellence of ours. And it turned out when we received the rating that there are two groups of parameters and one of these we are successful and uh, got, led by our May, we have been doing that for the last eight years and we have been improving our infrastructures and in transport and innovation or elsewhere because we invest a lot in technology parks, so we rank number two or, or by technology parks number. And we have 51 parks in our, in our city, and, and we also create clusters and set up clusters. It's about cooperation, not only about physics. 
these are technology parks and co-working facilities because they move up pull us up the, these metrics as regards the the growth opportunities we can see four areas it's venture investments it's the blood of the ecosystem then comes in ip issues and promoting patenting and commercializing and commercial application then come R&D issues and the fourth aspect the fourth element on which we are now designing is growing technology companies moscow ranks good by the number of technology startups who have a lot of talented guys here these are small companies when they attain good results they either stagnate or move to another city and this is something we should do to retain them and help them grow so recapping i must say that in these three areas four areas well in three areas we have launched already new new tools and here we have igor with whom we engage in pilot projects like the using intellectual property as collateral for loans we have a number of venture funds of our own we have been facilitating investments by business angels individuals and corporate funds and private funds now we are structuring also a bit of a spoiler of different measures and policies to support r d investments and we're thankful to you mr Goldberg, that you help us find our bearings there and uh, definitely whether it's worth conducting this or that type of uh, uh, research or study and this rating will be utilized by our team and i hope that as a result of the year we will see new measures applied so that next year we rank higher than number 10. i'm not sure how to treat the advice of of Igor not to be on top not to be number one it's not moscow style you know but anyway thank you for the efforts of yours for the huge work thank you very much i think it is a very good response very specific and instrumental something that is interested interesting to discuss well for example let's agree so that in the autumn we will get together again and you will tell us about practical advances since now in these four areas we'll be glad to meet you we'll be willing thank you all right it's a pledge okay moscow is also rich in development institutions not only authorities so now i'd like mr parabuchev alexey Gerovich, ceo of the moscow innovation cluster to tell us how these clusters well clusters are kind of a notional thing these are huge innovation hubs of the pan-russian level so how the cluster perceives the the findings the takeaways and whether this city development institute institution can respond to this system of signals thank you mr gohberg i also joined the plondits and the words of gratitude by christina in care of all the team who prepared the the rating indeed it was a huge work piece of work so just two points two quick points before i say how we respond to these signals and messages that are very powerful number one with re with regard to ratings it is always quite precarious on the one hand it's attractive and it has a lot of potential to unlock what am i referring to us being a city and the innovation agency the moscow innovation cluster which is a development institution we have been closely watching our peers and the position of moscow internationally technology and innovation and venture capital wise and we have been working with the foreign ratings and you mentioned part of them today well for us 
uh, ratings have always been a black box and we had analytical studies trying to sort out how it is designed it was always not so easy because like any any precious takeaways apart from the fact that we are being ranked number x was something difficult for us but this undertaking of yours has a principal difference a crucial difference this rating is only the top of the iceberg of the huge efforts this rating is a startup you know it is a an innovative project launched by the colleagues and it merits maximum respect and praise because the data collection was followed by the search of correlations which is most interesting and well the, the analysis of the dynamic status that is subject to change and the investigating the root causes looking into the root causes of what is behind the numbers and today's intervention of Evgeny has focused our attention on part of these parameters. What do interpreters, uh, interpret, entrepreneurs want? So the entrepreneurs look at the country-wide dimension, but you know, entrepreneurs are a global strata nowadays. They are the people of the world, like the creative leaders and the academic leaders. And if we want, and we do want to compete and rank on top of ratings, we have to respond to their global needs. Well, for us, it is a huge challenge because we are in, you know, the dire economic and political set of conditions and we have our strong points as christina has said which is infrastructure in this city and the quality standards life quality of this city but we have to step up the accessibility of venture capital to make Moscow education more attractive to move up from position number six, which is our current one, and uh, make sure that the global entrepreneurs choose Moscow as a beachhead to expand and develop their business. So what permeates all, all the um, uh, study of yours is, is what I have mentioned, these very specific issues. We will work on them follow through on them with your help so that we can foster the global entrepreneurial culture in this city to retain companies and bring in new ones so that they consider moscow as a global point on the technological development map with all the capability moscow has to offer thank you very much alexi i will come back to that especially later on I wouldn't like to interrupt our discussion, but you have mentioned several key points that I will definitely mention once again today. I have already made an announcement that we have Joe Rabbits online from the Manchester University. Joe is well known as a, a researcher of the city and urban transformation processes and the cities of future. So I'd like to invite him to join the discussion. Joe. Are you with us? Joe, welcome. The floor is yours. Hi. <clears throat> I'm, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, sorry I was late. Uh, and I have to leave in about five minutes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, a very busy day today. Uh, I was going to put some notes in the chat, but uh, since you ask, I'm uh, happy to uh, talk here. Uh, and maybe if I just uh, put these notes in the chat, all so, uh, is this possible? Okay. So, uh, 
if I run out of time, uh, then my uh, thoughts uh, so far are in the chat. Um, now, um, so I have worked on rankings and league tables and uh, indexes for some time in the field of urban sustainability. Uh, and every time we do this, there are questions that come up to say, okay, so, you know, Melbourne is number one. Okay, great. Uh, so what uh, is, do they uh, just uh, say congratulations to everybody and go home? Or do they say, let's do more? Or is this really for other cities to learn from? Uh, and so we say, okay, rankings and league tables can be very useful, not only for answers, but for questions. So we can talk first about the questions on the quality of the data. Uh, we have to talk about the definition of innovation. And the big question, first question there is, is it high tech and creative? Or is it a wider range of uh, things, including you know, social policy, uh, organization, uh, policy innovation itself, uh, cultural things, and so on and so on. And that then comes into a bigger picture of how society is changing and developing. Okay, we cannot do everything in one index, for sure. Uh, the question is there. Uh, we also need to bring in the question of definition of cities. Uh, I like very much the uh, approach of the, the methodology of this project. It looks very good, as far as I understand. But we also have to say a city is not only a city. A city is a crossroads, hub in a national system or maybe a mega regional system. Uh, the fact that Lima, for example, uh, I see is a leader in the fashion side of, you know, the creative industries. Great. But I think it is not only Lima, this is that half of Latin America uh, in which Lima is then the focus, focal point. So these questions come up and I don't see a single answer, but if we are going to use these results, then we have to keep this question in mind and say, oh, okay, shall we do this for Lima or shall we do that for Latin America? Uh, so I'll leave that there. And then there is, you know, question of definition of innovation policy. Uh, do we put money in and have soft uh, landings and smart visas, et cetera? Or do we say, yeah, actually we need to talk about the bigger picture. Why is this city a mess? I speak personally, you know, Manchester, for example, uh, somewhere on the index. Uh, half of Manchester is very successful, highly scored innovation. The other half is a mess with unemployment, illness, mental illness, breakdown of society, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. That then is leads me to talk about the questions of, so what? What do we do with this information? Or what can we do? Uh, and I like slide number 30 next to the end. It suggests the story of city types uh, or the beginning of the story. Uh, the cities are not only numbered on the index, every city has a long story. For example, in Manchester, the one I know best, or London maybe, that Manchester is a powerful mix. It has culture, especially the alternative radical activist, even psychedelic. Music, drugs, parties, etc. Very powerful. Then attract young people in. They then mix with the sporting image of the city, uh, two world class clubs here. Uh, and then that interacts with the university and academic systems. And then uh, from our previous industrial phase, we found some ways through to from a you know industrial decline to post industrial flourishing. And I say the word flourishing, not growth, because this suggests a, a, a different kind of picture. We did not just grow our uh, innovation sector, our innovation district. Uh, we allowed it to flourish. And I think that is important because it gives a rather different picture. Also, yeah, the history of Manchester and the, the region. Yeah, uh, the question was asked. <laughs> Why did other cities in the South not grow like Manchester? And the short answer is they were controlled by the Christian church for many hundreds of years after the you know, conversion of England after our civil war. Northern areas such as Manchester 
they said, nope, we are going to resist power of the church. We are going to do our own thing. And on that basis, they allowed the working classes to educate themselves. And following that, then innovation began to flow through the industrial system. And then investment came and trade came and so on and so on. So in other words, the message there, and not only Manchester, but many similar post-industrial cities around the world, is to say, yeah, you have to let things grow. It's like planting a seed. On that basis, yeah, we're working here on collective urban intelligence. Uh, this was presented at the ESEC conference uh, last time, and uh, we have a project with uh, MIOIR on urban innovation districts. The results of that I hope to bring back to your group uh, next time uh, in some months from now. So I hope that is useful. Thanks for the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, just a question. Um, you, you spoke mostly about the, the municipal level, so to say. But what is your view of the balance between municipal and national level policies to promote innovation at the city level? Uh, sure. Well, national level is where it starts, yeah. Uh, and especially when you get to the... Uh, the attraction of global talent, uh, global entrepreneurs, yeah, the national system comes first, and then the, the urban system comes after that. But also the urban system can be an attractor in its own, uh, on its own. So Manchester, we're lucky in a way, we have a good uh, uh, positive image all over the world mainly through football and music, <laughs> not so much through innovation, but then people say, ah, oh, yeah, I know Manchester, Manchester City, great, yeah, let's go to Manchester. In other words, the, uh, this is you know, what you call soft power, uh, which should then be supported and promoted by the national policies, you know, with our visas, uh, tax uh, regime for startups, uh, attraction of multinationals uh, to start a base, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just one example, I was um, uh, in a project on the automotive industries uh, run by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Uh, and countries all over the east of Europe, uh, you know, the, uh, um, uh, uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, et cetera, they were saying, yeah, we want to be innovation. Right? We want our, you know, to get the innovation into the automotive sector. How do we do it? And then we say, oh, okay, there's a game of power. Because the automotive sector is controlled from uh, Munich, uh, Paris, uh, uh, Detroit, uh, New York, uh, etc. In other words, the, uh, and they were saying, yeah, okay, you can have a branch plant because labor is cheap. Uh, and the production costs are low and the market is there of Europe and, and so on and so on. In other words, there is like a hierarchy of uh, national systems and underneath that urban systems, etc. Uh, and so then you say, OK, so what can the automotive engineers of Bulgaria or Romania, what can they do to get up the ladder of an innovation system? And I'm sure the same thing would apply to the, you know, the uh, regions of the Russian Federation. Uh, some of them are very remote and uh, you know, no population and so on. What can they do? So there is not a simple answer to that, but you could say, oh, OK, so we will recognize the reality of that power structure, that high hierarchy. Uh, and if we need to, yeah, we'll go to Munich and we will put our ideas on the table. Uh, or to Paris, etc. Uh, and uh, if we need to, we'll do things which are, you know, uh, outside of that hierarchical system. We can, and we see every day, you know, 18 year old engineering students, they create something which is wow. Uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the implication of that is to say, yeah, we need to make sure that our education systems are open to this creative effort. Uh, and not only to, you know, passing off exams with the highest grades, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there is one question in the chat. 
Um, a, a, a big question. Uh, okay, uh, the collapsing exodus since 2022. Yeah, this is on my mind. <laughs> I'm not sure how much I can say, uh, you know, without uh, causing some risk or something. Uh, and so, okay, well, um, I, I'm not maybe the best person to comment on that, but I would say what my comments are suggesting that soft power is uh, the number one, what we call soft power, and that means making friends all around the world, wherever you go. Uh, not to say that that is all that we do, but you know, this is like the, the starting point. This is where maybe the Russian Federation has a kind of a little problem right now. I really, really hope it can be resolved. But uh, the, uh, the implication is, and, and I speak as one from the UK, you know, we had our Brexit, we left Europe, we made a lot of enemies without any need to do so. And that means that our innovation system has a problem because people are now, you know, not coming to uh, UK. Uh, the multinationals are not setting up their uh, base here because they want to get into the European market. Uh, and all these effects are causing us, you know, quite a big problem. And now, okay, we uh, have a long history. We have a lot of soft power in reserve, but you know, even so, things are struggling right now. I think that's all uh, I can say on that. And, and uh, I will also say, yeah, many fantastic good things about Russia and foreign students. Great. And uh, the fantastic uh, technical capacity. Uh, but uh, we are looking for how, you know, how can Russia return to its position of, you know, friend to the world and uh, soft power uh, all over. So, Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. Colleagues, I didn't accidentally ask Joe a question. Colleagues, it's not accidental that I asked Joe the question about the balance between the national and the urban level. When we speak about Moscow, it is, you know, a unique case. Moscow can compete with some separate countries in scale and in power. But, you know, anyway, the city has its limits, after all, that have to do with some of the policies and their structuring. So now I'd like to ask Mr. Yuri Zubov, head of Russian Patent Agency, to say a word on that. I'd like to congratulate Yuri. I wish him a happy birthday. He has his birthday today. Despite that fact, he is with us and he could be celebrating now instead. But one, one, one thing to mention, one thing of importance, all the things that we talk about here has a bearing on the intellectual property market. That is something cementing all the aspects and or what is innovation and creative economy about. So over to you. Thank you very much for the congratulation and warm wishes. You know, the civil service wouldn't allow us any frivolous behavior. So it's my birthday, but I'm, I'm on duty. So anyway, representing a federal body, I would want to take up what is valuable and what is not and following the pattern of Moscow and Christina saying that it is of huge value. It is of importance for us to receive data in the unconventional type, not the statistics, but analytics. The invented data, the, inv the invented perceptions. I like this term, the coinage, not, not because I'm in charge of patents, no. Anyway, 
studying the report and the wonderful piece of research of yours. We heed some of the weaker points and we have been living in that system of reference. I have opened uh, new horizons for myself and there are some things that must be tweaked in the intellectual property here, which is an enabler for the innovative activities and to bring in new talents and commercialize different solutions. I believe that intellectual property is most importantly about science or about economy. It's an economic asset and the trigger for ensuing innovation is a trigger to bring and attract entrepreneurs in high-tech companies. For that, we need enabling conditions. I will not discuss and dig in the dull statistics like China sends 1.5 million patents per annum. They're strong quantity-wise, and now they want to improve on quality. Let's wait and see whether they succeed. For a number of years, we haven't had growth. Like in the first quarter, we had tentative growth. And it's like the balm on my heart. Uh, anyway, last year, we had growth at the expense. We have had growth now at the expense of the slowdown last year. Like in China, the university science have the lead. They count for around half of the applications. With respect to prior year's trends, well, we have had some shifts. We have, we see tentative growth in some of the fields and sectors of innovative activities, and these are sectors adjacent to critical ones that in previous years were developed by the government and promoter. Now, what I wanted to say is that surely as a person who is in charge of uh, patents, uh, IPs, or our uh, innovative potential to be unlocked, we need the right environment set up by the government, and that's what it has been doing. So we're not we not just sit idly and watch it. Moscow is a hub in innovations and IP's copyright becomes some kind of part of the goodwill, intangible assets that help you to promote your products. And I believe we just need to fine tune our legal framework a little bit to make sure that we can monetize it. So that would also inform decision making at the federal government level and at the regional level as well. It would be great to apply this model to apply the model of the Leuven University, its commercialization model. Now, I'm sure that the high school of economics can match that university and the quality of the specialists uh, is beyond doubt. But the commercialization, the monetization model is worth an applause and in terms of patents, in terms of monetization, I 
They are top notch. 43% of their prototypes are then rolled out and uh, must scale. And there are offshoots, you know, high tech uh, startups uh, that uh, then develop uh, the ideas born in one of this one of the world's major universities and some of the ideas are now being reviewed by the government as part of the business climate uh, review action plan definitely we need to adapt it uh, to our russian circumstances uh, on patent stats that was used uh, as a reference point. We didn't mention this. Trademarks could also be an important uh, benchmarks of uh, economic growth. We don't need to take all of the trademarks, there is the international classification, it's quite a big one, and maybe you can zero in on some of the trademarks that are more closely connected with uh, innovations, and use them not to ramp up your own figures to push Moscow even higher, although it would be it would definitely be the case, and Moscow would in go up in this uh, ranking, but the trademarks and the use of trademarks as part of the franchising agreement is an important tool. We discussed it with Christina a lot. That would definitely signal the quality of innovative business. And as a sum up, You know, Farfetch, Mr. Porter, well, these are, you know, UK-based uh, shops. I think that e-commerce is uh, going ahead in Russia as well. And there are some e-commerce uh, platforms that uh, can uh, beat uh, all of those British uh, e-commerce uh, platforms. Now, back in the 1990s, everyone talked about Moscow, Rome, Milan, London, Paris, and always Moscow has been top five uh, in terms of fashion. I don't know why we are lagging behind this in this uh, index. Maybe it's wrong. You know, we've got so many fashion brands here and there are so many lads and lasses uh, who are well versed uh, invested in uh, fashion but if you take the sales fashion sales i would get the moscow and could beat with paris well maybe dubai could be top one right now but some of the big uh, European capitals could be lower, could be behind us. Well, I haven't seen the figures, but, but I still believe that there's an element of emotional sentiment uh, to it. I don't know what we do with fashion. Um, well, I guess we still can use some of the in incentives to invite uh, innovators and fashion people to come to uh, our towns and cities. I believe we need to set up the right tax breaks uh, for these kind of entrepreneurs. 
Uh, and there have been some drastic measures that have been taken. We have this patent box mechanism. And sometimes the income tax from monetization of patents uh, is uh, brought to zero. There are utility models uh, used in other countries. If you take Turkey, tax rates are went down to zero. We do have this patent box. Uh, it's been uh, on for two years, and this year we've fine-tuned it a little bit. And I'm sure it's going to be used uh, more often. So the 17% uh, rate uh, regional tax went down, and it's, I mean, it's the same at the federal level, 3%. Some of it's flat. Some of the regions uh, decreased this uh, rate a little bit. We just need to do more outreach activities. We need to hammer it home to do more communication. Wherever we meet, we, whenever we meet with the governors, we try to hammer it home. We say that uh, you don't need to tax uh, the uh, income that uh, is uh, just, uh, you know, growing is uh it's not that big so it, in most cases it's uh, makes more sense to to gauge the potential well i say christina because you know i know her a lot and i'm sorry if uh, it sounds uh, um maybe uh, in too familiar a way and uh, just the description of what Moscow does uh, is a cause of envy in other regions that seek to catch up and replicate it. But definitely it would make more sense to get uh, funding from uh, private institutions and not from development uh, institutions or the government. So it's best to be able to monetize uh, your prototypes. And I really appreciate the Moscow government or their efforts. They work with the Central Bank of Russia. They work with the Ministry of Economic Development together with us. And thank you for these decisive steps. It would be ideal if most of the Russian regions could uh, roll this practice out and uh, set up the right environment for these creative innovators that would uh, boost the innovation in rating and index, uh, the appeal of our cities, very good cities, by the way, in your valuable index that would be the better side uh, table book for us, uh, the Bible for us. And we're ready to exchange information with the High School of Economics and work in a strategic manner together. Thank you for your uh, praise. And well, that's your event, but I'd like to use this opportunity to invite you. You know, we've talked a lot about lending with uh, IPs as collateral. But on the 26th of April, our colleagues will ha host a major conference on IP. Moscow is uh, the venue, that's the Lomonosov cluster, the Moscow State University. So they unveiled this uh, new facility in uh, the district of Araminki in Moscow. We invite everyone who's interested in innovations monetization we'll have a dedicated session to this i we've invited everyone it's a pilot for us so we really appreciate the central bank of russia's bear bank uh, and uh, russia's uh, patent office uh, ross patent uh, and or maybe if you are a high-tech firm and you'll need uh, this kind of loan you are highly welcome thank you well, yes, please, you can uh, share this information with us and uh, we will uh, send it out. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, stakeholders 
Well, I can invite you to this event as well. That's a, an appropriate, uh, a very appropriate comment. Thank you. And now, Mr. Medvedev, who is head of NTE, that's a development institution that is supposed to think about foresight, that it needs to invest in the future. And in this case, our ranking, our index is kind of a congruent uh, with it. And he lives in the city and he used to be a mayor, the mayor of one of the most innovative Russian science uh, cities, science, town, science towns. Over to you. Thank you. I'm, it's always a great pleasure to be with you to listen, to be able to listen to your reports, interventions. It's like a club. Thank you for so many insights uh, that you share with us. And that is food for thought uh, that has informed me in a lot of my decisions. And I continue thinking about these ideas after our meetings. Thank you for the invitation. Indeed. What I have to say is that the products that you demonstrated today, the, the brainchild of a year-long intensive effort, this index uh, is uh, valuable for the forward-leaning people, policy makers, uh, decision makers, Everything is important. 74 criteria, the methodology, and the outcomes. So it is a great product in itself, and I'm sure it would add to the momentum. It will help the city to grow and uh, it's like a tool, basically, for the mayor So it's a kind of uh, a milestone that uh, we have reached and uh, that we can uh, somehow evaluate. So the High School of Economics allows you to uh, get uh, this 360-degree uh, view and thinks, think of the step forward of an action plan that we can use to go forward. Now, I'd like to use a few metaphors uh, to go to the conclusions. Our friend from Manchester said a few interesting points. He said, we need to look at the background of this particular place. Well, Manchester is a, has been there for centuries, and there have been a lot of milestones. And what you see today is a testament to what happened in the past. And as we work on these indexes, as we review it, we need to go back to Soviet times. That paved the way for certain specializations they laid the groundwork for it. Our country is a vast territory, and Krasnoyarsk 26, uh, the, I was their mayor's mayor, and was a sign city, and and they had uh, the right minerals that. Uh, provided for the national security of the Soviet Union. And we cannot take those uh, small sign towns and to move it elsewhere because they are connected to the source of the, the raw materials, the inputs. So what about the campus of Novosibirsk called Akadem Gorodok, that's the science town. And you know, as Mikhail Kovalchuk said, uh, 
Now we need to have a mega science facility there. It's uh, abbreviated as SCIF, this mega science facility. So how can we launch this uh, mega science facility? Now, based on the history, back on the background, you know, is what I believe. You know, there, there are so many regions out there, and you know that you travel a lot on business trips, and everyone has the same goal. But if all our territories uh, implemented in the same successful way, will the blanket be as wide as broad? Or, you know, what are our priorities? So we need to move into some kind of uh, economic policies based on this data that you've accumulated, based on this, the strength of your stuff. How do we translate it into national policies, well-balanced, forward-leaning, not just short-term, those that would incorporate some foresight and insights? like going forward into 23 to 2027 20, or 2030, for example, as ambitious as it might seem. But can we glean any of the, you know, the pieces of the new trends, emerging trends that would in, be translated into the decisions by the federal government, for example? Something that could be taken up on board by the um, local government. Now, here's my second uh, idea. 10 to 15 years ago, I went to Paris and I talked to one Frenchman. He was um, 15 years older. And we talked about, you know, routine stuff. And he says, I've got a mortgage at 2%. Uh, and I told him, come on, give me a break, 2%. And uh, he says that there's a high mobility. I may go to another country in the EU. And I've been thinking of the fact that I'm building a new house and I'm going to spend so much money that I have to stay in this particular place. So that's a different mentality. So there's the difference of mentalities in Russia and uh, in the European Union. You know, right now there's uh, a pivot to Asia and that's a different mentality again a different uh, socio-cultural mentality. In terms of creative class, creative community, you know, we're actually happy that we focus on technology, creative industries and urban environment. You know, we're catching up on the urban environment as for the creative industries. Well, the US, as Americans, as you say, and, and now switch, moving to China. Will we go to China as well? So definitely I'd like you to go deeper in your research. I hope you don't just rest on laurels and you continue pushing beyond the just ranking so that so you can feed some decisions for the policy makers. And finally, something that the Agency for Strategic Initiatives is working on and uh, as well as we at uh, our institution. How do we provide for prosperity? What is the share in our country's prosperity of the territories uh, which exhibit a quite high science potential, like Moscow, St. Petersburg, Kazan, and some smaller cities? How do we do it? How do we unlock this potential? Can we leverage uh, that science potential to push for stronger prosperity? Do we really have that potential? You know, sometimes, you know, you just self-hypnotize you. It's just like a mantra, nothing's happening, but uh, you feel like you're in paradise. So that we're not, uh, we don't self-hypnotize ourselves into believing we live in paradise. 
We work a lot with uh, startups so for, from Moscow Innovative Cluster. From, we, we work with Mr. Zubov from Ross Patent from the Russia's IP watchdog. And it was a case study. A businessman went to work with us, came to us, and he said, I worked in the Baltics. And in terms of the quality of production, they live like on, in paradise. But what about the difference in the country? And, you know, he came back because there was some pressure on Russians. There was a lot of, uh, you know, this cancel movement. So he came back and here's a story he told me. You know, I didn't figure out how to deal with it entirely, but when I was in Riga and I came to Dresden to an exhibition in Germany, and during the day, I built a three-year production plan just standing at that exhibition and just people signed some contracts. And so I could fill my three-year pipeline with orders just during one day. While here in Russia, yeah, sure, it's so exciting. You have some wonderful partners, but in terms of markets, you know, here's a problem. You know, they come to me and it's like electric engines and then they say, can you give me 10 electric engines? I mean, how can I do it? I mean, I cannot really produce, I can't really do custom, custom batches like this, like 10 electric engines. So we talk a lot about future commitments, about future products. That's the new concept. And that would be exciting if you had a tool to somehow to make sure that these territories would be open for the market, particularly those uh, that are aspiring to be high-tech startups. At least that's how we want to work with, to provide more transparency, more openness in the market so that the domestic market would be enough to pay back your investment to get enough ROI, ROI. So, so there's so many challenges in here you need a, a strong market to, to pay back your investment I hope that Moscow will help in this Moscow has been leading with this and been, um, it's a come up with some groundbreaking projects. And thank you for the invitation. You've been inspiring us. There have been so many insights that I heard here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Medvedev. So we're out of time. Well, we can stay, you know, for another 15 minutes if you have the time. Sorry. Well, I got your hint. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Ojan Saritas, a uh, professor from the High School of Economics, uh, to give us a review, a kind of a wrap up for our discussion, and then we might have a few questions. So I hope you hear me well. So, uh, well, first of all, uh, let me join all the colleagues and friends uh, to congratulate the team. Uh, they have really done an outstanding work. So uh, I, I really uh, appreciate the effort they've put. Actually, uh, it's a very brave uh, effort because it is one of the first of its kind, uh, not only in Russia, but also uh, globally. So uh, this, of course, the uh, deserves the uh, appreciation, first of all, because they're always starting a new thing. And actually they haven't started new, so they have been doing this uh, for already three years. And we see that how it is growing, for example, to cover more uh, cities in the world today, from 30 to uh, almost 200, which is a, a much longer list of cities. 
And uh, I'm hoping that this effort uh, will continue. And of course, I'll be happy to support them by all means. Um, so yes, I'm actually from Istanbul. So one of those cities which was listed and I lived in Manchester uh, and studied there in university and my professional life also goes in Moscow. So I've been to most of those uh, cities uh, which have been uh, mentioned actually today in this presentation. So, uh, and also my background is architecture. So just to re-emphasize, uh, which is also bringing together all these uh, different um, elements which makes a city a city like with its people, with its infrastructure, with its industries, service industries, manufacturing industries, which are actually there to generate value because we are gathered in big cities, for example, like Moscow, because these are the main centers where most of the economic and social activity take place. So uh, therefore uh, it is very important to have a look at how the cities perform and see what kind of improvements we can make so that those cities can be more innovative and they create more value, not only economic value, but at the same time, social value and the visibility across the world so that they can become main uh, centers of attraction for many people, which gives them, of course, a lot of value. So uh, as we see in some of the leading uh, cities in the world today, so they managed to build their brands and the people will be happy to be there and they will be proud that they are from that city or they are working or living in that city. So why not to bring our cities also to this level of standards in terms of wealth creation, in terms of quality of life, in terms of achieving some sustainability measures, for example. So there are a number of things which uh, need to be done in order to give a city higher ranking probably in this uh, list. So, and there's always some space for development, especially in this very uh, rapidly changing world. Um, so I'd like to actually make uh, three points. So thanks to Leonid for putting me at the very end of the meeting, because I was planning to talk about what is next. So uh, there are several things I think uh, to be done as a follow-up to this work. Um, first of all, to make this work internationally visible. So uh, we need to make sure that we share this work, we announce this work, and it is actually recognized one of the key uh, works and key um, kind of references uh, to be used maybe by some international organizations like some by the OECD and the UN organizations and the others. And we had really good connections with them. And then uh, I guess they will welcome to look at what has been produced here. And they will be, um, if not now, hopefully in the near future, they'll be ready to cooperate uh, with us uh, to make sure that this sort of uh, studies and this particular contribution can be used as a kind of an international measure and with the recognition by many countries in the world. That will create a lot of advantages for us. Uh, first of all, um, in terms of collecting data. So now we have a huge team, a dedicated team of people who are sitting there or listening to us now uh, online or offline. So I really appreciate the effort they put to bring this work together, but it's also a good idea to establish a global cities network, for example, and have the representatives uh, from those cities that we are talking about so that they can provide, for example, some data from first hand. And they won't only uh, provide data through uh, such a network, it would be also possible to share some best practices within cities because uh, you need to, uh, if the data is a skeleton, then you need to build body around it. So those case studies, best practices will actually help us to see how things work in the field. Uh, most of the indicators we use today in the system are actually connected to each other. So we need to understand their interconnections, their interdependencies, how social, economic, political, environmental factors, they come together and then shape the entity, which is called city. 
So uh, it is very important then to look at those best practices and then understand what are the key dynamics which are creating those practices. So what are the drivers and how can we then assess those drivers, for example, to go to next step to develop some strategies, some strategies and policies at all levels, at the national level, because we already have discussed that national level is very important and also it should be connected to the city level or regional levels. So there should be a synchronization of their policies. And of course, also other stakeholders should be in the picture, like the industry, for example, um, be it like a manufacturing industry, as we know, which create a lot of value and also creative industries, which is now a part of the process. Because in leading cities and countries, we see that uh, most of the economy is actually composed of those service economies, as we call, and creative economies are already parts of that. So how can we, for example, increase the share of service economies in this city to move it to a higher level in these rankings? And also that sort of network would be helpful to see what the future strategies are. So we can, with the data analysis, of course, we look at the past. So what has happened so far and where we are right now? So we have a good snapshot of that with this report. That's a great background work. So what is next? So it would be also useful to see what plans and strategies they have, for example, for the next 10 to 20 years and so on. The second important point uh, I want to make as a next step is how to create value out of this analysis, out of this report. So as I said, um, this report is at the moment an analysis. It's a descriptive analysis which is bringing a lot of data together and then analyzing them around some indicators and then showing us the picture as it stands. So um, I think in the next step, the real research begins. So we will now try to understand, for example, with the um, more advanced analytics and analysis. So what are the key questions? What kind of hypothesis we can establish to understand those dynamics which are creating those cities, successful cities and good cases across the world. As we know, um, technology development, creative industry and urban development, urban environment, which are the three key pillars of this report, are not independent from each other. So we need to understand what are the linkages between all those um, criteria we use, all those indicators we use, and how they come together to create some synergies. So this is a research question. So we need to move this work from a descriptive analytics to some real research so that we can really create some value out of it. So we will achieve some real value once we explore some synergies and connections and some real dynamics and driving forces. Because as I said, those indicators don't create kind of a successful city standing alone. So they should exist in a kind of a systemic way, in an interconnected way. And the next one, the third one, is of course to ensure that this uh, study continues. So uh, it has an immense value. It has a good beginning. And I called it as a brave effort it is brave because uh, these indicators, for example, may change in the future. So how can we handle that issue, especially with those uh, emerging technologies, for example, uh, Leonid at the very beginning mentioned the, like, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, it is role uh, in our lives and all the kind of other technologies that we are talking about, not only in terms of like um, analytics, but also coming into our lives, like shaping it, in many different ways, technologies in the healthcare, technologies in education, technologies in transport, industrial revolution, they won't come into our lives one by one. So they will come all together and they will create some dynamic changes, which will force us to continuously review our indicators for technological development, for example. What we mean by technological development? And what we mean by creative industries, for example, may be quite different in the next three to five years than today. 
So uh, that is one of the tasks, of course, for uh, our team. So to continue um, monitoring these changes, update those indicators and see how we can improve these metrics in line with the changing world. So in uh, having said all this, uh, I think uh, this work is an excellent start. So this was probably the hardest part of the initiative to start that and to bring something on the table. It is of course open to criticism. So if you look at it, if we you know, go deeper and then see the background data and so on, we may raise some questions, but again, we should continue with brave and then try to understand how we can take this opportunity to improve that because at least we have a solid piece of report now on the table. So this was the hardest half of the way. And the second half is actually to open it up, to share it, to make sure that it is globally accepted, for example, in the medium to long run, and then to see how we can improve that uh, further. So let me finish that by congratulating the team again and expressing my full support for their work. Thank you very much, Ushan, for this excellent uh, overview. And we'll certainly come back to, to your idea about uh, further research. Thank you. Yes, sure. Okay. We can, um, this should be uh, published and shared, of course, with the rest of the world because it has an immense value, definitely. Okay, thank you. Коллеги, я предлагаю еще минут 10-15 посвятить. Colleagues, I suggest we dedicate 10 to 15 minutes to an exchange of opinion, a brief one. If anyone is willing to, to speak up, we'll be ready to take your comments or questions. The floor is open. Colleagues, thank you very much for this report for the rating. I think it will be of interest to contemplate the, the academy of young and old cities how are we able to to know when a city was born or when it became uh, megapolis and my second thought is about talking to those super mobile innovators creative leaders not those who were born in Beijing and stayed in Beijing and becoming Nobel laureates and winners. Well, we will not be able to measure anything and everything, but probably as a result of our efforts, new factors that are hard to measure will emerge and they may be maybe kind of very basic and very underlying. Well, the rating correlates with other important things. So I'd like to hear from the people that move around the world quite often and listen to their preferences. Yes, definitely. We will record everything and we'll come back to that. We jotted that down. Uh, more, more comments? No. Then let me conclude. Let me summarize. Before I thank everybody for the participation, well, we have managed to seize some of the colleagues and take them out of their busy schedule. Not everybody has been able to withstand 10 to 15 minutes more. Unfortunately, several people have not been able to attend. Some were delayed at a business meeting, others had to go to a business trip. But anyway, it has been a productive discussion. A few key takeaways to mention the key words that were pronounced. Christina and Alexei have mentioned, have spoken about the fact that Moscow considers itself to be part of a global landscape, which is important. And this global policy context would not allow us to go provincial, parochial, something that is lacking in uh, some federal discussions nowadays. It is a principled thing that 
we need to talk about more discussing the toolkit on the city level another contiguous issue is the correlation between the city and the federal authorities and despite those breakthroughs there are some on, on the on the urban level there are some limitations like Evgeny and colleagues analyzed discussing the mobility and retention and Eugene mentioned that and there's a whole set of data right behind that it's about the attraction of jurisdictions the appeal of jurisdictions over the past year and a half there have been huge shifts of the IT industry but there are some other some more important sectors for them it's also of relevance and uh, it, it's not a, by chance that I ask this question I'm talking to Joe and he called the tax regimes and visas and other policies and measures then uh, demand incentivation also must be put in the list and that correlates to the global context of policies like aiming solely at the domestic market is is a dead end Mm. It will slow down the competitiveness and the reduce the scale for the for the big solutions. Commercial application of solutions in the IP market is something that we still lack on the national level. Moscow has been able to come up with some case studies but on the national level it is still a big issue to to resolve so Vladimir mentioned the 10 engines story so we should incentivize demand in concert with intellectual property market development and uh, another important issue is talking about national and regional policies alongside urban level the urban level so we should probably come up a guide with a guide on the policy measures and my last point would be as follows well the colleagues have said that the rating analysis is a toolkit so we shouldn't shell this instead we should use it apply practically to make things better and the, the very last nitty-gritty thing of ours is like alexi has mentioned and i was so gratified to hear that that our rating is not a black box it's transparent you know and we definitely make it our characteristic trait to be fully overt and open and transparent and we are fully open on data and parameters and everything all the evidence those who do not like their standing may recalculate and may uh, and make sure it's it's appropriate this concludes our round table i think all those attending we will continue the work and have some follow-up and in the autumn we will have another meeting and another gathering with you thank you Colleagues, there's a coffee break over there it's my first time on the premises